Hey everyone, welcome back to the Energy Blueprint Podcast. I'm your host, Ari Witten, and today I have with me Nick Polizzi, who has spent his career directing and producing feature-length documentaries about natural alternatives to conventional medicine. Nick's current role as director of Remedy, Ancient Medicines for Modern Illness, stems from a calling to honor, preserve, and protect the ancient knowledge and rituals of the indigenous peoples of the world, and to bring amazing undiscovered medicines to people in the West. Uh, plant medicines, natural plant medicines mostly, that can help heal many modern illnesses. So with that in mind, thank you so much, Nick, for, for joining me. It's such a pleasure to have you. Ari, I'm honored to be here. Yeah. So first of all, I'm a huge fan of what you're doing and the message that you're putting out into the world. And uh, I, I'm also jealous, I have to say. Um, you know, when I was younger, when I was a teenager, I remember like, for certain classes kind of drawing pictures of me like scuba diving on coral reefs and and kind of like extracting certain compounds from corals to try and find medicines that were going to cure diseases and you know now most of my time is behind a computer screen writing and you're down in the amazon like doing all this going on all these adventures and trying to find all these undiscovered you know healing compounds and um, it's funny, you're doing what I kind of fantasized about doing when I was a teenager. Pretty cool. So I'm, I'm jealous, I have to say. <laughs> well, yeah, thank you, man. I, 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 you know, it's, it's, um, it's fun. Um, fun balance. It's, it's a little bit of work balancing that with a family, I got to say. You know, I've yeah. got kids, two small children. So it used to be, I'd say, a lot easier to be like, you know, you know, yep, put on like your Indiana Jones hat and like just, you know, um, cap, be, be cavalier about it. Just kind of go around the world and do what you got to do. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, I used to be able to pick up and just go around the world and do what I had to do. And I still do that, but there's a little bit of my heart that never leaves, you know, Boulder, Colorado and my two boys. So I love what I do. Don't get me wrong. But, uh, but yeah, things get a little trickier as you, as you get older and you start a family. Nice. So how did you, how did you stumble into this? How did you, I guess, first get into health? And then you started going down this path, you know, with the sacred science and going, kind of going on all these adventures down to the Amazon and, you know, doing all these, this, these explorations of medicines from indigenous peoples. How, how did that, how did you stumble into all that? So my path started uh, the way that a lot of people uh, on this healing path um, start, start out. And that was with my own illness. I grew up on the, on the East coast. I had, um, four or five aunts that were nurses at the local hospital. Uh, modern medicine was the way of my family, you know? Um, and so when I started in my early early 20s getting migraine headaches, um, ocular migraine headaches, I turned to modern medicine first. That was all I really knew. And um, I went to one of the best neurologists um, and he tried a lot of different things to get me better. Um, ocular migraine headaches are terrible, by the way. Anybody who's listening who's ever had one knows it's not, not a headache. They shouldn't even call it a headache because it's just a totally different thing. It's basically like a combination of a broken bone in your brain and a stroke. Because, I mean, a lot of times you can have stroke-like symptoms during them. Like, you know, I was talking to um, uh, someone earlier this week who, who still gets them. And she was saying that she goes numb and, and um, loses functionality in, like, part, you know, one hemisphere of her body when she gets them. So very, it's a very tricky condition. Um, and so when I started getting them in my early 20s, it was scary. I turned to modern medicine and um, one of the best neurologists in Connecticut, um, I was lucky to see, and they put me on a bunch of different drugs that would work slightly for the first couple episodes. I was having one or two a week. And then after, you know, two or three migraines, they would stop working. So I was just going through this Rolodex of different pharmaceuticals that had their, a, a number of their own fun side effects, you know, in, in addition to kind of only working partially and then not working after a while. So I didn't know what to do. Um, they were running MRIs. They thought maybe there could be something more serious. And ultimately, I came in one day after having had one of the most severe migraines that I'd ever had, where I literally was trying to talk to my girlfriend and word, the words I was trying to say were coming out as different words. And, you know, I had to be in the dark for um, about 10 hours uh, straight with absolute quiet and like, you know, a cool rag on my head and just literally could not communicate with the outside world. Like I went in to see him and he said, well, Nick, you know, that was the last preventative. That was the last drug I could give you for this. He's like, the only thing I can do for you now is put you on something that's more of a preventative drug that will maybe work, but, and will definitely cause, 
um, some alterations in the way you perceive your reality. And somehow, even though I was in my early 20s, I was in numbskull. I was living in New York City, you know, um, drinking, chasing girls around, being, being a moron. You know, like I, I still at that point knew that that was where I had to draw the line. Like I, had, I was like, no, I can't. I saw, I had seen a couple of loved ones go on antidepressants. Um, re, you know, within that same span of time, and saw what it did to them, and saw how they how they just completely just went into like this this total. I don't even want to say a coma, but it was almost like there was like this a slight emotional coma, you know. Um, and I'm like, I'm not, I'm not doing it. I'm not, I'm not going there. I need to at least know who the hell I am, you know. So um, I walked away uh, from that office, and that's in desperation to start trying to figure out on the internet what <laughs> what else I could try to do. Um, cause he said, listen, you, this is terminal. I mean, I, I, I left that part out. He said, this is terminal. This is, this is how it is. This is how it's going to be for your life. You know, um, this all, all we can do is try to figure out a way of helping you cope with this problem. And so, on, on that point, I would imagine that probably, I haven't looked at stats, but I would imagine uh, a, a number of people with a condition like that probably end up committing suicide. I don't know. Yeah. Who knows? I'm sure. I've never looked at that either. It's really, really, um, <laughs> It's a, it's, it's a big deal. It's one of those things. I mean, a lot, there's a lot of illnesses out there. Just to go off on a, on a tiny little tangent. There's a lot of illnesses out there that, you know, we've all become so familiar with that it almost makes them sound benign in a way. And, or or um, they're just so usual that we don't really think about them as being something like that, like you said, could cause somebody to do something drastic like that. Mm-hmm. But some, something like an ocular migraine headache twice a week will ruin your life. I mean, it derails your life. You cannot live a normal life. It's too, you're in pain all the time and the pain, and no one understands it. And you're always in fear of it happening again. And it does happen again within a matter of days. And so you just never know what you can and can't do. I mean, there's a lot of conditions like that, but migraines, ocular migraines are one of those. And so then I, I went on, I, that's how I found my way onto the healing path. It was not because I thought to myself, you know what would be cool? I, I want to start working with herbs. Because I, honestly, that was not where my brain is. I'm, I'm, a New York, I'm a New York Jets fan. Like I'm like a, I'm a, I'm, I, was, I was in five, I was, I, was a biz, I was a real estate investor in New York City. The furthest thing from my mind was, I want to start, you know, working with herbs and going to yoga and think and seeking out energy healing practices. I had no idea what the heck that stuff was. Yeah. Um, so it was really out of desperation. And again, like I, the people that I interview, a lot, you know, especially the people who are not native folks, people who are like, you know, from the Western world who are interested in this stuff. It's usually, I mean, I got to say at least seven times out of 10 in my experience is because they or somebody they knew got really sick. And as many as, as often happens, but is very underreported, they're failed by modern medicine miserably, miserably, and they um, go on their own healing path. And so that's how I got on this path, which led me to herbs. It led me to EFT. It led me to other energy healing practices, and it also led me ultimately to shamanism. I think that's a beautiful segue into your your last documentary that you worked on. You, your current one is Remedy: Ancient Medicines for Modern Illness, but the, the previous one that you've that you've done is called the sacred science where you took a bunch of people down to the Amazon people who had severe illnesses. And it was kind of like this documentary adventure, you know, where you're following these people as they're going into the jungle, uh, looking for cures to their conditions. Can you, can you talk about that whole documentary and how things played out with that? Sure. So I made two documentaries after I got better. So the, the, you know, the part I left out is within six months of me leaving modern medicine, I was completely hundred percent cured and have not had a migraine since. So, I mean, and that, that, yeah, actually let, let's go, let's go into that. <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's, let's go into that first and then we'll get into the sacred science. Cool. Yeah. I mean, so, so I, I gotta say like, I, I credit EFT with a lot because EFT tapped me into my body. It got me like, it literally tapped me into my body. It literally tuned me into emotions. I never knew that, you know, as a, as a dude, like just a normal guy, I don't even know what a normal guy even is these days or what kind of like, you know, how, if that's offensive to even say, but I, 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 I was just this, this Northeastern Connecticut, New Englander kind of guy. And I was raised from a young age, not to really look at my emotions, not to really give them much credence. That, that was a pretty sissy thing to do in my family. You know, I'm not, my, my dad, is, my parents are great, but that's just in my society, looking to examining yourself too much was a little bit weird to try to do. Um, and so this period of self-examination was helped a lot by, by EFT. And I started realizing there were these undercurrents of and these energies and thoughts and, um, and ways of being that were not normal. 
I thought were normal. I thought that, that was just kind of the way it was. But I mean, when I started really tapping into it and hanging out with more people who were a little bit more enlightened than me, I realized that these were choices I was making. And so EFT really helped me dig into those things. And once I got sent more sensitive to the subtle energies that were going on inside myself, that was when I started really being able to dial into herbs. Because I know, you know, herbs just seem very like chamomile tea, like nothing's, you're not going to feel any of it. There's, there's, there's nothing valid about it. There's nothing, it's not potent. Drugs are, the, drugs are the way to go or else there's, you know, no other option. But once you tune into your body, you start working with plants and start working with diet, as you know, you start sensing in your body what you're allergic to. You start sensing in your body what makes you feel good, what doesn't make you feel good. Um, and so that was, that was my entryway, you know, EFT and energy medicine was my entryway into herbs, which was my entryway then into, um, you know, shamanism and rituals. Because as you open up the Pandora's box and you realize how much more there is going on inside you, and you start finding out that who you thought you were is absolutely not who you are, then you just have to keep on going down that path, which is turned into the path. That was when we decided that we were going to make the movie called the, the sacred science was was you know i made the movie i, I ended up making a movie with um with nick ordner um of the tapping solution who's a good friend of mine from a long time ago yeah, and then we, we i've actually had him on the podcast as well so a lot of people oh, cool. so, will be familiar so ordner and i went to went to high school together middle school together um you know people don't know this but he couldn't speak english until he was in second grade he came over from Argentina and he, um, and he just did not have a word of English and, you know, he just turned into a New York Times bestselling author. So that's like, you know, pretty amazing, pretty amazing um, uh, human being. Um, uh, so he and I um, made the Tapping Solution. Then we made um, another movie called Simply Raw, Reversing Diabetes in 30 Days as a part of that too, which is more on the dietary side. And then what I noticed was when, in, while we're shooting these things, Behind the scenes, something that I would ask a lot of the people that we were interviewing, just out of personal interest, was, you know, who is your mentor? Who is your guru? Because we'd be sitting down with these big, big name people, you know, Jack Canfield and all those folks. You know, there's people that you that you you know, you're like, wow, you know, who did you learn from? Um, and when you ask them that question, a lot of times, you know, I don't know how no percentage it was, but a lot of times they were there was people being pointed to that didn't live anywhere near us, and they were not gray-haired white men. You know what I mean? We know that we're wearing suits um, in front of a camera, which is pretty much all the experts that are in a lot of these, a lot of these um, personal development um, and nutrition films. Um, they were they were they were native people. They were people from other places, other continents. They were elders. They were wise people, and that was very intriguing to me. And so that kind of made me realize that where I wanted to go next, not only because the, the on the on the on the herbal side, um, you know, uh, but also on the um, on the, the the wisdom and the personal transformation side, um, it was something that looked like it was the next place to go. Shamanism, um, native practices, um, healing rituals, ancient medicines, and so that's that turned into this path uh, of discovery where we just started. You know, me and two other people um, on our team um, started to research shamanism, and at that point, it was very hard to find a lot of good information on it because it was not what it is today. In ten years, it's really it's really just blown up into something. Back then, it was like the dark, the dark corner, dark cobwebbed corners of the internet. You'd find little, like little sites, you know, that would talk about it, you know. Um, and so we pieced together um, this kind of, um, um, we called it the wall, where there was just a map of the world, and we started kind of putting, putting different pins in places and starting to get an idea of where where these cultures were still alive the um the resources that these cultures had at their disposal to heal people because we knew we, we knew what we wanted to do we wanted to take people someplace to get healed so we wanted to find out the best possible location for for us to take a crew of people or a, a you know a group of, of very ill people to get better so and i would um, imagine a lot of those pins ended up in uh in the amazon area <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Because not only does the Amazon have one of the, one of the most thriving um, cultures of shamanism left on the planet, I mean, I, I'd say, you know, in Africa and, and Siberia are probably the two other places that I would say are, are just as just as um, alive still. But the difference between um, Siberia and Africa, at least the areas of Africa that we were looking, and the Amazon, um, is that the Amazon has over eighty thousand species of plants. Less than three percent of them. I mean, now I'm basically quoting sound bites from from the film. But I'm, I'm gonna try not to I'll put it in my own words. But basically, three percent of those 80,000 80, plants have been studied, and of those three percent, uh, some twenty to twenty five percent of our cancer treatments are since have been synthesized from those plants. 
but there's 97% that haven't been studied. And the only people who know those plants are the indigenous people. So, I mean, we're like, okay, so there, there's this very alive and thriving culture of shamanism, and they have at their disposal the biggest, the biggest pharmacopoeia of medicinal plants in the entire world. Yeah, let's go there. Yeah, yeah, and I, I, think, I think there's an interesting point to be made there, which is that a lot of us growing up in the West, growing up in the United States, for example, have this conception of, of modern science is like, oh, we've, we've already discovered and researched like, you know, all the plants that there are and, and the different extracts of different herbs and things like that. We, we already know kind of everything there is to know about all these plants or maybe not everything there is to know, but we've discovered 90 plus percent of the medicinal plants that, that there are to discover. Yeah. Um, I know that I certainly used to be under that impression and, and it's just, it's actually the opposite is that we, science has just scratched the surface as far as how many of these these medicinal plants we've actually found and and researched yeah it's totally true there's and there's all kinds of reasons for it um but uh it, it's 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 exciting to me because i mean you know you think of this world as a place where you know man has been everywhere so what's you know there's nothing original anymore who's gonna you know there's nothing left to do we've already figured this place out well that's that that that's that just told you how little we actually know Mm -hmm. we, we know three percent of and and so i say eighty thousand species of plants in the, in the amazon it's not even not even close like, i mean like that's that's the conservative number number i say so i can't get trolled um the the ethnopharmacologists and ethnobotanists that i talk to who are down there all the time say the number's continuing to grow they estimated that far over a hundred thousand species of plants and that's with deforestation continuing to take a lot of it away they're still finding more and more species so wow. um and and that number that three percent number it holds true for most of the most of the plants around the world um, uh, I think that there's something like 450,000 species of plants in the world. And I think some similar, some similar percentage of them have actually been studied. So think about that. Um, you know, we're looking for cures, you know, we're looking for, you know, to all these, all these diseases. Now you and I know that a lot of these diseases are, are lifestyle, um, diseases that we probably could settle just by being, being a little bit more responsible, but the ones that aren't, you know, um, think about that. Like, you know, so a lot of our medicine comes from there. You know, it's the medicines that a lot of medicines that people think are were just kind of born in a, in a factory come from plants. You know, the easiest one being aspirin. Aspirin comes from white willow bark. Um, it's just that that's where it comes from. So, you know, the, 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 one of the one of the most consumed drugs in the world comes from um, a, 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 something that you could probably find in, in your state somewhere. You know, if you looked in the right spot. Um, so. Uh, and uh, like I said before, a lot of, a lot of, uh, cancer treatments, um, are and the most potent ones come from, um, come from trees and barks. Um, so what does that mean? What does that mean for, for the possibilities that are out there? You know, if you're sick right now, listening to listening to this right now, what does that mean to you? I mean, doesn't that, that has to give you a little bit of hope. If the doctor, t doctors have told you there's nothing left for you, well, that's according to their playbook. You know, that's not, that's not according to the world's playbook. Mm -hmm. and, and also, you know, on the, the small portion of these plant medicines that have been studied, um, and, and I don't want to get too conspiracy theory in here, but most physicians, most conventional MDs don't receive any education in, the, you know, even the herbs that have been studied mm -hmm. um, or a nutrition class or, you know, for that matter, or just the basics of, of lifestyle medicine. Um, they, they're just, they're not being exposed to these realms of knowledge. So even the stuff that has been studied, you're probably not going to find out much about those things from your local physician, unless they're one of the small portion of, of physicians that has gone to, to great lengths to educate themselves on their own. Yep. Integrative, integrative doctors and, and functional medicine doctors, a lot of them really, really do have strong herbal herbal backgrounds. Robert Roundtree, I'm not sure if you've yeah. ever had him on the, you know Robert Roundtree? I do, yeah. I, he, I have actually been meaning to get him on because uh, he's, he's big into a particular topic of interest of mine called hormesis. So he's, he's yeah. one, one of my next guests that I, I would love to have. right down the street. He's in our new series. He's just, you know, he's got a lot of brilliant, brilliant stuff to say about this. I mean, he's just a great example of a functional medicine doctor who mm. is just, um, steeped in herbalism i mean you know he's he's graduated from you know some of the you know most prestigious universities like, all that all that pedigree if you if that's something that matters to to you you know but like but really first and foremost he realized like somewhere along the way he's like hey um 
I want, I got into this to help people and the stuff that we're doing, some of it works, but a lot of it really doesn't work. So what else can I do? So, I mean, I like to your point, you know, a lot of doctors out there are really just, and this is something that I've had to get over because I like to, you know, I tend towards, towards extremes. So when I first healed myself using herbs and, and, and alternative medicines, I started kind of, you know, looking at modern medicine suspiciously, like this is all kind of a, a crock. And then I've just, I've just slowly but surely come over to the fact that no, everybody's, you know, most everybody's on the healing path, you know, is out there to help people. And a lot of doctors are on the healing path too. They're just trying, they're trying, but that's the way that they went. And a lot of them are realizing that they need to mix in other stuff. And a lot of them are doing that. So mm -hmm. uh, Roundtree's great. You should have him on the show for sure. He is. Yeah. I really like his stuff. So let's talk about the sacred science for a minute. So what you, you took a bunch of people down to the Amazon who had a variety of different illnesses what what were the the results or what kinds of experiences did, did people have so we had um three different cancer patients we had a patient who had neuroendocrine cancer we had a patient with prostate cancer another patient with breast cancer we had a um someone come down who had crohn's disease very advanced we had um another person come down who had um depression and addiction we had another patient come down who had um, advanced Parkinson's disease and I always I always lose track of these things and we had we had another patient come down who had diabetes I'm not sure if I said said that one before um, and then final finally we had a, we had someone else um, come down who had um, IBS and so um, the results varied I think the way the way that we put it in the film is um, five came back with real results two came back disappointed and one never came back at all so um, you know, I think that part of what we did when we were making the movie is I just wanted to be real with people. I mean, I, I'm, I'm, and I think you probably see this, you know, in, the, in this space, there's a lot of people saying all kinds of stuff about, you know, they're trying, making all kinds of claims. And I think that what we did with that was, Hey, we're just going to tell you exactly what happened down here. And there's fortunately for us, amazing things happened uh, in a lot of ways. And, but there's also, you know, there was things that happened that people, certain people didn't get the results that they wanted. I think that the nicest thing about it all uh, was that every single one of them had a profound spiritual transformation. So if we're measuring things based on physical improvement, you know, I think that those numbers are pretty accurate that I just gave you. If we're number, measuring things based on, on um, personal evolution and the disintegration of limiting beliefs um, and illusion, um, everybody came back, you know, whether they were like physically improved or not with um, cause we asked them all we're like, so how, you know, and everyone was like, I, this, this has been so profoundly beneficial to me. This has been, you know, one of the most transformational experiences of my life. So on a spiritual level, on a consciousness level, I think that it was like a hundred percent success rate, but, <laughs> um, but one person died while we were down there. Um, so that can be looked at as a failure, you know, if you wanted to look at it from like a medical, medical perspective, but a lot, everybody who's on the inside, including the family member of this person was like, you know, that was like that, that was exactly how that was supposed to go what um, were the details around that as as far as um the, i mean that's well, not, just so people know because uh, i i'm already i'm aware that 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 person already had a terminal illness it was only yeah. a few weeks to live if i remember correctly and sure, yeah yeah so, so that was gary gary came down and he had neuroendocrine cancer um it wasn't looking good for him and he was he, so he was there for 10 days and um and he had a i don't want to say he had a crazy healing breakthrough but he went from not being able to walk around because it hurt so bad to be able to walk around and, and really enjoy himself and we were all like whoa this is this is incredible gary like how are you like you have tumors all throughout i mean so he had tumors all throughout his body um and he knew that this is very likely not going to, this was going to be his final, his final destination. Um, but then he was just had these, ten, these, you know, let's say at least a week of just, you know, feeling like he was on the mend. And the last couple of days of his life, he was like, I don't feel, I don't feel any pain anymore. So we were all like, what is going on here? Mm. Um, this is crazy. You got to keep an eye on Gary. Like, this is, this is nuts. He's really going through some kind of transformation. So he, um, he passed away like on uh, day 11 um and uh he had a pulmonary thrombosis and um some people uh some of the doctors we talked to say that it's say that it's actually part of 
it doesn't necessarily mean that, that it wasn't working. It just means that it might have, it might have caused, a, a, caused an issue. We'd actually never had an autopsy to kind of look at whether there was, um, there was a reduction or a shrinking in, in the tumors um, inside of him. But um, pulmonary thrombosis can happen when, with this condition when um, tumors like dislodge or break off and can cause problems you know, once, they're, once they start to go away. So um, it's possible that was it. It's possible that it really wasn't him getting better. He was just kind of in this kind of final, final 10 days of his life. But I do know that he was, he died pretty happy. You know, he was a pretty happy man down there. And then, so I called, I remember after he died, like that next morning on the satellite phone, I called up his sister, which was a very hard phone call to make. Um, and I was like, Susan, I'm like, I'm so sorry. I've got bad news for you. And like, I was crying and she was crying. And I was like, I'm so sorry, you know, blah, blah, blah. And she's like, what are you talking about? She's like, you already said goodbye to all of us. She's like, he, he knew, she's like, she's like, you don't know this, but the doctors told him that he was going to be alive for like four or five more days, you know, when he got on the plane. She's like, he barely, barely even got on the plane. Wow. He couldn't, almost couldn't make the transferring, the transferring flight. So she's like, she's like, he didn't want us to tell you because he didn't think that you'd let him come down. And I'm like, oh my gosh. So, um, so he came down, you know, he came down knowing that he was, he had days left and just didn't tell us about it. So, you yeah. know, that, that was his path, you know, and that was his journey. And it was like such an inspiration to the other, to the other people that were down there, the other, the other, you know, the other individuals who are working on themselves to kind of see him being so strong, even though he was so far gone, you know? Yeah. So that was, that was our story. Yeah. It's complex. It's not, it isn't like, you know, what, what it sounds like when you say somebody, somebody went, came down with us and, and died. Um, it's, there was, there was much more extenuating circumstances. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's why I wanted, <laughs> wanted you to clarify because the way you originally phrased it was like, Oh yeah, we took him down there and we killed him. You know, yeah, exactly. <laughs> a little bit more nuanced than that. But, <laughs> um, but you know, I, I think it's interesting. I think it's interesting that even five of the, what is it? Eight people actually got really good results because from my perspective, the odds are really, the, the, de the deck is stacked against you getting results. And what I mean by that is, you're taking people from the Western world living a completely different lifestyle and suffering consequences from the modern Western world's lifestyle and then taking them down to, you know, South America to indigenous peoples living in the jungle um, who have developed a certain medical tradition um, that hasn't emerged to treat those illnesses they've never even seen most of those illnesses and you know their 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 traditional medicine culture is not about healing those conditions it's about healing the conditions that emerge in their culture so totally. you know it, i mean it's it's honestly amazing and remarkable that you were that that they're able to get significant results with those people you know, if you talk to healers, it's, it's a great point. If you talk to healers down there, and I know that you've done your fair share of work in these realms, um, I, I've heard it said so many times, they're like, listen, it's so easy for us to heal our own people. It's just so easy. He's like, they, he's, and, and I don't know that it's necessarily just because of environmental things and, you know, them growing up, yeah, just them growing up with these plants around them and maybe having some kind of a, of a you know, um, some kind of a synergy with them. Um, as much as it is, and this is what these guys tell me, it, it's because they have fewer blocks. They trust us. They trust the medicine. Yeah. They don't have any skepticism. We tell them it's going to work. It works. Mm -hmm. you know I mean? So people come down here and they're expecting a miracle overnight thing, and that doesn't happen. And then they all immediately just get discouraged, um, and, or they come down here distrusting it and just kind of you know um, with all kinds of emotional baggage and mental baggage. Um, and then we got to cut through that first. I mean, that, that's why ayahuasca, as much as it's become a a little bit stigmatized. Obviously, it's become very a lot more popular in the last um, last decade. Um, but that's why it's so beneficial, and you see it used across the board in these healing traditions. Because they call, at least in my experience, they say we got to before we start trying to do anything, we need to clean the slate. We want to start with a clean slate. So mm -hmm. before we even try to start messing with you know this disease, let's start getting, let's start shattering the beliefs you have and shattering this this like these illusions that are that are kind of clinging to you so that you can start seeing things clearly. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's so important, you know, and, and again, some people are like, oh, hallucinogenics. Well, now that Michael Pollan came out with this book, I mean, everyone, everyone and their mom is now, now microdosing on mushrooms, but, but, uh, 
but you know, but for a while, and probably still now, I'm sure a lot of people are. They hear high ayahuasca, they find out that it's, it means the vine of death, and they that it can give you crazy come to Jesus type um, visions and and things like that. Then they say, nope, that's where I get off the bus. But mm-hmm. I mean, you got to look at it that way. I mean, how many? What kind of a what kind of a, a mental cage have you imprisoned yourself in? I mean, we all have them in some way, but I mean, some people have really really thick bars on theirs, you know, and so. You know, before you can start, you know, working with the subtle energies of what's causing your disease, a lot of times you had to like actually break free from this thing and understand that you're not this, you're not your name. You know, you, like you and I have talked about, I think you and I might have talked about this on our, the time we, we talked a month ago. Um, you're not your name. Most people think that they're their name. You know, most people, if you ask them who they are, they're going to say, oh, I'm Bob. You know, and you ask them, well, who else, you know, I, I get it, but like, who are you? Oh, well, I'm a, I'm an electrician. Like, Whatever it is, like for some reason, Bob the electrician seems to be my my uh, example there. But but um, <laughs> but but no, people don't really want to get that get that real with themselves, and they can't. They don't have the words to describe who the heck they actually are. So I mean, I feel like I feel like that's a good that, that that's a good starting point. It's like you know, if you can't if you can't get deeper deeper than that, then you know that you've got some bars that need to be need to be sought away at. You know. Yeah, one hundred percent. And you know, I I want to mention a few things at this point because we're gonna. I, I would love to talk a bit more about entheogens yeah. um, and hallucinogenic plant medicines. Um, but there's, there's a bit of a, it's kind of like an interesting barrier that emerges here where you can talk about these kinds of things and talk about the kinds of experiences that one can have on these things. And, but people who haven't actually experienced it, won't really be able to to wrap their head around it and and i i know because prior to me experiencing some of this stuff and i heard people talk about these kinds of things i i just thought it was a bunch of crazy talk and i was like okay this person sounds like they've lost their mind yeah um and this is a bunch of mumbo jumbo nonsense so for everybody listening who hasn't experienced any of these um hallucinogenic plant medicines what I, I just want to preface by saying open your mind to hearing the, the, the message here without judgment and without skepticism um, and, and consider the possibility of maybe what they could do for you. So with that in mind, um, one thing I want to talk to you about, Nick, that I, that I know we, t- we talked about on our phone call several weeks ago, is when you went down there to study, uh, you know, to film some of these, these shamans doing this work, they were actually skeptical of you initially, right? You know, and, and they kind of was like, well, how do we know we can trust you? And why should we let you in here? And why should we let you film what we're doing? And, you know, how do we know that your intentions are good? And so they kind of, they put you through some stuff, didn't they? Yeah. Well, you know, this just, just a touch back on something that we were talking about a few minutes ago. When we say that there's that only uh, 3% of these plants have been studied, it's also not just because modern medicine doesn't, want to study them it's also because they burnt tons of bridges down there so mm. they look at me as some as some gringo with a camera and a crew who wants to come down and like do this thing and they're like oh great so there's another gringo who wants to come down here and like you know take something from us you know like mm-hmm. so um there's a reason why there's a reason why um only three percent have been studied down there the, the doors have been closed for the most part you know what i mean if they if they get a whiff of anything that they think is you trying to push some kind of agenda that's not going to be um righteous and just so yeah they didn't they didn't want to talk to me necessarily and uh, i think that sit, that sitting in ceremony really is really was the was the equal you know was the um the um uh the equalizer <laughs> you know, it was, it was, and, and just just real quick for people not familiar with the use of language what do you mean by sitting in ceremony so sitting in ceremony um before i could really um before i was before i was able to maneuver very easily down in south america and do anything i was going to do for this project once we realized we wanted to film down in the jungle um, the first thing, the very first thing before anyone was going to even talk to me more than like literally a casual conversation, um, in like a coffee house kind of a thing was, okay, um, well on Saturday night, come, come here to this address and we're going to sit down and, and we're going to have a ceremony. And so that was how, that was how it went for me. And so my first ceremony was absolutely, you know, it was, it was probably the, the most strongest, um, most, um, most, uh, 
uh, heart wrenching, gut wrenching ceremony that I've ever um, I've ever been in. And um, and so, yeah, that that was ultimately what it turned out to be was um, uh, the first few ceremonies were just their um, their mechanism by which they could understand me and understand who I was. It's like a truth serum. I mean, like, you know, it's very hard to sit in an ayahuasca ceremony and continue to have any ulterior motives. <laughs> <laughs> it's the ultimate truth serum. I mean, I'm sure, I'm sure that somewhere in some, some way the, the, the United States government has tried to figure out a way of using this for some, for some type of, uh, of a tactic. Um, um, so yeah, it was, it was absolutely, um, epic and, and it was something that I've, I've come across that in a couple, a couple different scenarios in a couple different types of, of, um, of, in a couple different cultures. So, so similar to the ayahuasca ceremony, I would say the sweat lodge is an intense, is an intense ceremony too. And so some people who might not have, who might be listening, who haven't, um, worked with a hallucinogen, you know, but who's all, but who have been in a sweat lodge. Well, I mean, the intensity of a serious, serious sweat lodge and the intensity of a serious, serious ayahuasca ceremony, I'm not even sure which one I dread more. I mean, they're both, they're both, it's, it's really what we're doing with these rites of passage um, that, that keep me so intrigued and, and loyal to them is that we're playing with, playing with, playing, we're not playing with, but we're, we're stepping into intentional intensity. That, that's the way I look at it. Like, you know, so I know I'm walking into an intense environment. I know it's gonna, and, and without intensity, I don't think any rite of passage is really fully complete. I don't think, I don't really believe in that as being a rite of passage. Um, so um, your, your step. I, yeah, I, I just wanna point out one, one thing that, that's interesting that um, is worth mentioning to everybody that hasn't had one of these experiences yet. You said, I'm not sure which one I dread more. <laughs> that's an interesting contrast to some people who, who haven't had an experience with something like ayahuasca um, who might think oh these you know psychedelics and hallucinogens these are you know this is just a bunch of kids just running off trying to get high and and go on drugs and and be high and and feel that feeling of euphoria and and bliss and you know it's just drugs and just being high mm -hmm. and what you just said is i dread having this experience <laughs> like i i dread the the idea that i'm gonna go sit down at the end of this week and do one, another one of these ceremonies. You dread it, why? Ex explain that to, to, to people who think that these things are just about getting high and being euphoric. What, why, why, why are they not correct in their assumptions there? You know what's nice, so, so I don't think I've ever discussed it um, juxtaposed with um, sweat lodges before, because it's, really it's a really good one, because that's one that we can actually describe with words. Yeah. Very hard to describe what happens with ayahuasca. Um, we can do it, you know, um, and, and it's relatively effective. But I mean, I, um, but with uh, sweat lodge, you can really understand that. So you walk into, so um, this last experience I had, um, like maybe two, maybe, maybe it was two experiences ago. I'm sitting there. I'm in northern Wisconsin. I'm hanging out with some Native American men who are welcoming me into the si a situation. So I'm like, and so I don't like enclosed areas, period. Like I'm, I do not like enclosed areas. I'm, I'm the kind of person that when you, when you go to a restaurant, I'm sitting looking at the exit at all times. Like I'm just, well, I'm, I'm always, for whatever reason, like there, that could be a, a genetic thing. It could be some unresolved trauma. I don't know, but I don't like enclosed areas. Um, Especially small enclosed areas filled with a bunch of hot, sweaty, naked dudes. <laughs> and, and a mound, a mound of, of like, of like literally glowing hot rocks. <laughs> um, um, and so, you know, I don't, a lot of people probably haven't seen, um, what a convention, what a conventional, what a, what a traditional, um, sweat lodge looks like, but it's nothing really, it's nothing very epic. It's not like what, I forgot who the guy was who heard all those people in that big tent, that the, the dome that, you know, Ray or Ryan, the guy from the secret who yeah. had this lodge that people heard, got hurt. Nothing like that. That's a huge, like circus tent. I don't even know what that was, but, but a regular sweat lodge is literally, if you're standing, you know, at, at a, if you're standing, um, you know, at like five ten or whatever, then this, it, the top of the roof of the thing probably comes to your waist. I mean, like it's dug into the ground. It's very, very small. It's very, you know, it's maybe 12 feet in, uh, across. Uh, it's just a small little kind of a, of a hut, you know, that you have to kind of like walk down slightly into. It's dug into the earth. And, you know, uh, the proper sweat lodge is packed. It's like that little thing is packed. I mean, like you have like, um, there could be two tiers where there's like people sitting up on the, on the top of the top rim and people who are sitting literally like with their knees almost touching the, 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 the pile of hot rocks. 
And um, so I'm at this thing in Wisconsin, Northern Wisconsin. I'm totally honored to be there. I'm like, this is crazy. Like I'm, I'm the only, you know, one of the only, if the, if not the only person, um, you know, who is, you know, the only white male here um, at this thing. Um, and I just, I'm there to make contact. I'm there because of what I do for a living that you were, you were saying before, you know, you're envious of me going and tracking down medicine. Well, this might not be one of those one of those parts that you'd be envious of, of like, you know, having to put yourself through this stuff. And also, you know, those, honestly, most, what I've experienced in the Americas at least is most native folks do not trust us. You're, if you're a white dude with blue eyes and a beard, you know, like you're, you're sort of, you're, you're, you're like the quintessential guy who like, you know, you know, they, 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 they steer clear of, you know what I mean? They're like, okay, yeah, here we go. Here's yeah. this guy coming to try to have an experience or here's this guy coming to try to write a book. Here's this guy coming to try to like, liberate us from our own problems or here's this guy trying to make a name for himself you know so i mean i go in there knowing all this stuff so it makes it even more important that i could hang in a sweat lodge you know what i mean so you have you have not only the fact that you have these this pile of hot rocks stacked up and you have these elders most of them are older dudes who are just piling in like there's no way it's like a clown car like you how are these people continuing to get into this sweat lodge and i'm packed in the middle of it all don't know these people. I know they probably don't trust me. And now we're in this mid the middle of the worst possible environment for myself. <laughs> there's no dark, there's no light. It's not like, it's not like it's a tent that has any transparency to it. So there's no sunlight coming through or they can't, it's literally just, it's skins. It's animal skins on top of, on top of sticks that are bent. And then they close the flap and it's complete darkness. And then they sing and you just sit there as this plate, as this thing sp fills up with impossibly hot air. And so to try to compare that to, to an ayahuasca experience, I think that the first, the first thing that happens in an ayahuasca experience that makes it horrifying to me, when it's, when, at least for me, when you're in a strong medicine experience, is there is a, um, a problem. For me, there's always an issue with getting, getting oxygen. So, so um, there is a, there's a feeling of um, disintegration. Your body, your body feels like it's going away. Um, you might think that that sounds like a pleasant thing, like, wow, all my aches and pains get to melt away and just I get to be this, like, this water spirit. There, your body, your, whatever the ego, whatever you want to call it, the thing that connects your soul, if you believe you have one, or just your brain to the rest of your body, does not want to feel that. The idea of your body disintegrating into the ground, into a puddle like the Wicked Witch, is not something that your body wants. It's just, it, it's an absolute, it's absolute free fall. It's a, it's a feeling of, it's a feeling of death. And I think that's why they call it the vine of death, because the feeling is I'm dying. I'm no longer here. And it's not like a pleasant thing. It's not like, oh, I, it's like, oh, I just took, I just took ayahuasca. And now I'm having this experience. Well, this is, this is, this is what they say is going to happen. So I'm just going to go with it. Like, there isn't always going with it with ayahuasca. Because a lot of times the very, me very mechanism by which you can give yourself some, some positive self-talk um, or some positive um, uh, words of, words of, uh, of, of encouragement or um, just just be your own ally. Somehow, somehow that part of you can get taken away. You know, the kind of thing where if you've ever um, smoked smoked a joint before, or um, even if you had too much to drink, you can at least tell yourself, okay, I'm a little bit drunk. I probably shouldn't have had that last glass of tequila. You know, that's like you're still there. You still have cognitive function. You're you're still in control to some degree, and you're just kind of going with it. There is no going with it when you when when you ha feel medicine coming on. Yeah. Um, you know, a lot of times, and, and now that being said, some, some people will say that it can be a very joyous experience. For me, it's always been, um, uh, when it comes on really strong, a feeling of that same sensation of that flap closing on the sweat lodge, which is, I'm not going to be able to, I'm not going to be able to handle this. I'm not going to, this is too much. I, I should never have done this. I should never have done this again. I'm not going to be able to do this. I'm going to die here. And there's always that feeling of I'm going to die here. Um, when there's, when there's strong medicine that was poured and you feel it coming on, there's always a feeling of like in the back of your head, like for me, again, like I'm being very, very candid here. Some people, some people are like, you know, will can abuse, I don't want to say abuse, but some people who take ayahuasca every single day will say, no, man, it's great. You just take it and just do your thing. But for me, it's, um, it's a feeling of, I almost have to kind of put my, put my affairs in order. Like but before I step into a, an ayahuasca ceremony, cause it can, it can change who you are, you know? And so you can come out of an ayahuasca ceremony and have, have a whole new insight on life and, and go in a completely different direction. So my, but, but, but even more than that, even though you know that nobody ever dies when they take ayahuasca, like there's just, unless there's other foul play, unless there's something else going on, like, you know, the, the, the number of fatalities are extremely low in comparison to other drugs and things like that that are taken with ayahuasca. It's just not a risk. Even though you know you're not gonna die, 
when you sit there and the medicine starts coming on, or sometimes these days, even now, when I sit there and I, I drink the cup and I go back to my spot in the circle, I'm like, how did I just find myself sitting here doing that again? Like, how, am I, how did I just do that again? I'm sitting back down here right now. Like, I know exactly what happened last time. Like, how, how did I just get myself to do that again? Yeah. Um, because it just is so harsh and so intense for the first hour or two for me. Mm-hmm. So I think that, that, you know, the, the sweat lodge is intense because literally you can't breathe sometimes in there. It's too hot. It's too hot and there's nowhere, there's nowhere to go, you know? Um, and with ayahuasca, it's, it's this feeling of, um, of, of complete, um, ego death. You know what I mean? It's complete. It's, it's like, you, you can't be yourself. You can't be who you thought you were anymore. You go into there. You can't, my stories about who Nick is don't, don't have any, don't have any, they're not going to help me in an ayahuasca ceremony. Like, in fact, they're going to hurt me. So, so you walk into a ceremony and you something, something deep down inside, like, especially if, you, if you've been through it one time, you know that you've been playing games. You know what I mean? Like, you, you know that you've been up to no good ever since you got out of the last one because we just get back into these patterns. So I think there's part of that too where you're like, you're just horrified at the fact that you're going to be exposed again and you're, and you're going to have to shed all that stuff and all those things that you, that you have there for a reason because they're spackle. Like, there's spackle on a wall that's cracked and you don't want to see the cracks. You know what I mean? You don't want to have to go into those cracks. So the, the first thing that, gets, that, that, that happens is all that, all that spackle gets power blasted away mm-hmm. and you have to kind of deal with who you are again. So... And what do, I know this is a terribly tough question to ask, and I'm glad that you're the one answering this instead of me, (laughs) but uh, what swinging white light, I need a swinging light up here. (laughs) (laughs) Why, why do this? What, what do people get out of this? I mean, you know, probably some people listening to this who have never experienced this and maybe are not even inclined to do it or are sitting here listening to you and are like, why is this guy, is this guy a masochist or, or what's his deal? He's, he's intentionally subjecting himself to something that's really, really difficult and harsh and painful. And he's saying he dreads it, yet he's doing it again. Why do this? What do you get out of this? And what do other people get out of it? Do you ever go through, I'm kind of saying, the, asking you, but really asking everybody. Do you ever go through life and you find yourself in situations where, whether you're alone, whether you're in groups, where you're trying to be better than you currently are and you can see and you could feel in your periphery there's something there that you're just not quite able to see that's holding you back mm. like it's just like you, it's 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 agonizing and I, I, maybe some people won't relate to this but i think a lot of people get this like you where you're trying to be who you know you could be And which is awesome because I mean, just doing that, amazing. Like the fact that you're trying and you're aware and that you're trying to head toward that, amazing. But as you're trying to do it, you're like, there's what, I don't get it. Like, I want to do this. I know that this this is who I want to be, but there are things that are making, that are limiting. I have a spoiler on, I have a, um, you know, whatever it is. I I have, I have this like, this this, like weird ceiling, a glass ceiling that I can't see that's preventing me from getting there. Well, for me, like that, that, that was like an earlier period of my life, which is when I first started working with, with native plants. Like, was this a period where I knew I was in a rut. I knew I wasn't doing, I knew that there was a thing going on in my life that was holding me back. It was a dark period. I was, I had, I just, I, things, even though I couldn't put a finger on what it was, everything on the outside looked great. I just didn't feel happy. I wasn't thriving. I just, I, I, I was over it. I was lost. I didn't know who the hell I wanted to be. I didn't know what I wanted to do. Um, my health wasn't great. Um, it was, it was um, an entheogen that shattered it all uh, unexpectedly, and so that was how I started working with entheogens um, uh, and and you know like, <laughs> psychedelic plant. I don't I really don't work with um, uh, synthetic um, stuff. I, I I really only work with with um, with power plants, you know, and teacher plants because mm-hmm. um, I just feel like there's something there's something to them that really resonates with me a lot more but but that's why I work with ceremonies in period because like I think that there are certain things for me I mean some people might have had the most perfect upbringing and they might have had parents I mean my parents are again were great but like the most perfect circumstances and maybe they were empowered and maybe they don't have anything like that maybe they're actually maybe like they're absolutely going after it they don't need that maybe they don't need to work with these with these types of um of of, of interventions um but for me Ever since I healed myself of migraines uh, using alternative methods, I've been very suspicious of anything that I think is impossible. You know, 
um, especially things that I think are impossible limitations that I have. So I would do these ceremonies because they're the only way that I can get a look at that. I can, there's the only way that I can get a look at the thing that's holding me back. And it's never like, here's everything, Nick, that's holding you back. Because I think that that's almost like your body or maybe the medicine or however you want to call it is there's enough intelligence not to show you everything because you probably would just have a panic attack and die. But, <laughs> but, but there's always just gives me the glimpse of like the next thing. It feels like you're scaling. You know, there's so many meta uh, analogies. It's like, you're, you're scaling the mountain. You know what I mean? Or, um, you're, you know, you know, all I need is the next finger hole. I don't need, I don't need to know it all. I just need to know I'm, I'm gen in generally I'm going in the, in the direction of, of who I'm supposed to be. And I have my foot on something and I have my, one of my hands on something. So sometimes you're just looking for that next handhold. And I, that only way, I mean, sometimes you can get it through a lot of things. I like the long distance run for that reason. I like to do fasting for that reason. Um, Cause you can get those little insights and those little glimpses into that stuff too there. But, but when I find myself in an ayahuasca ceremony, ceremony, usually it's either A, because I know it's been too long. And I know it's been too long when it's been over a year. I'm like, okay, well, it's time to go back. You know, this is this time. Or if it's like, you know, a period where I just can tell that there's stagnation and there's something that absolutely, like one of, like my, one, of, one of the shamans that I work with likes to call it, he's like, a shakeup. Sometimes you just need a shakeup, you know? And, and, uh, and, um, and, and, and when I know that there's, when I know that, that there's stagnation um, and I know that I'm really hurting on something, like if I know that I'm not being good to like one of my, if I know that I'm being moody to like, you know, if I'm being like, I'm not, I, I have a block or some calcification around a relationship with a loved one, like even that kind of thing. I'm like, that's hard, man. Like, I don't even know how to get through that. Sometimes you, it's just one ceremony away. You're like, oh, I get it now. Like the next morning you, you, next morning you wake up, are you covered in vomit? Maybe. Are you like, you know, are you, are, have you been through something really kind of scary? Maybe. But do you have answers? Hell yeah. Like usually you have answers. You come back, it might not be, it might not be the, the, the most pretty thing in the world, but in that, in the middle of that place, like the, pure, the, the fires of purification, you're sort of all of a sudden start seeing truth. And then you start looking at your life with that, through that lens and things are very, very clear. Yeah, beautifully said. You know, I, I think of it like upgrading the operating system. It gives you little upgrades to the next level of operating system meaning more love, less attachment, less struggle, more compassion, more creative energy, more insight, um, more acceptance of wounds and traumas, and living your life from, from a new vantage point, a new perspective. And it gives you these, there's, like you, you, you said, there's an intelligence. It's a non-self intelligence. Some people call it God, other people, you know, maybe atheists, but even whether you're, you're a religious person or an atheist, you're going to experience some kind of non-self intelligence that is very clearly not just your brain, um, not just any of your normal brain's way of, ways of thinking about things, I should say. It, that'd be a really great experiment. Like, you know, like they had to get like 20 atheists and then yeah. sit them <laughs> and then ask them the next morning. So what do you think? <laughs> yeah, totally. Yeah. yeah. And, and well, you know, I've had, I've gone through, you know, I, I don't know that I would call myself an atheist necessarily, but I'm definitely not a religious person who's talking about God all the time, but I've definitely had some experiences that have, have showed me that there is some kind of intelligence that doesn't feel anything like any of my normal thoughts or feelings or ways of looking at things. Um, and it is very, very clearly a, a, of a higher degree of wisdom that is guiding me and showing me and teaching me new things and, and new ways of being in the world. Totally. And, you know, th there, there's an interesting aspect to this, which is that it seems to be an intelligence that often guides you into wounds, traumas, um, things that are blocks for you. You know, I'll, I'll give an example of a, a friend of mine who actually a, a, a wife of a friend of mine whose father committed suicide when she was very young. Like literally her, when she was in the house having dinner, um, her mom told her dad that she wanted, she was going to leave him. And he literally went upstairs and hung himself in the house while they were having dinner. And you know, she's, she was, I think 10 years old or something. So her, she did a, you know, a, a journey, an ayahuasca journey. And, and, and had to relive that. And it was a, it was a terribly painful thing. And, and I know lots of people, and I myself have also, you know, 
kind of, it's guided me back into some of my own wounds. But, you know, there's a saying in, um, in Jungian traditions of psychotherapy, the, the gold is in the shit. <laughs> and what, what they mean by that is there, if you can gain a new perspective on your past wounds and traumas and accept those things that happened and heal those wounds and come and start to, to see them from a new perspective and maybe even see the blessing and what those wounds have, have given you, the, the positive side of them and how they've actually been blessings in your life. Or if you can start to cultivate how that experience can be a blessing in your life, that's how you turn shit into gold. And uh, I, uh, this type of medicine seems to be an intelligence that just facilitates that shit to gold process. <laughs> right? Yeah, it, it's, it, you, you just reminded me of, of like the first and second ceremony I ever did where it felt like literally, and, I, and, and so people, a lot of people call ayahuasca grandma because it has this feminine maternal, very, but, but very like, you know, hard, rigid but loving type um, uh, energy to it. And I remember like, you know, for a couple of those ceremonies, it really just felt like after I got, got through the initial free fall of feeling like I was going to die and then realized I, really, I actually wasn't going to die, but I was going to feel like I was going to be dying for a while. And I got through all that. Then every time after like, like uh, two hours of maybe, maybe an hour and a half, two hours of that free fall type trying to get, fig figure out the, figure out like the, ba the, the balance system of the whole thing. After I kind of got my bearings and let, let go of all the thoughts and, and started, um, being present with just what was happening in my immediate re my immediate reality there would be this like feeling of her kind of coming down and you know first of all saying hi and saying you know thank you you know whatever some kind of dialogue and then it just felt like it would always turn into me being picked up by the scruff of my neck like a puppy pretty much and just dragged into different scenarios from my past you know, and, but at that point it would be always like a, Hey, do you want to see the next thing? Like at that, after a certain point, it became more of like a, a total conversation because the assumption I guess was that, or maybe like the, what was being said was that I had already gone through a lot already. So it wasn't like there was, you know, it was, it was optional. Do I want to kind of just chill <laughs> and like, just kind of like, you know, or do I want to like start going and start and go with her more? Like, well, I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to totally go like, I, you know, I'm totally going to, I'm going to, now that I'm here and I understand that I'm okay. And, and also honestly, the fact that you feel like there's another presence with you that's watching a benevolent presence that you, that you feel, it doesn't always feel like there's a benevolent presence there at first for me. Like, you know, when you're the come up, the comeuppance part, it just feels like you're on your own and, and you, you might've made a mistake, you know, yeah. or you know, this is may, maybe not going to, maybe, maybe this is going to be the time that it's not going to be okay. You know, you're not going to be like this, get through this one. But then after a while, there's always this, this, this amazing energy that descends upon me when I try it, you know, I'm not, I can't speak for everybody, everybody, but, and then it just feels like, like you said, you spend the rest of the night. Um, for me, I spend the rest of the night being guided into my darkness and, and it's horrifying. But then once you realize that you're not alone, you know, it's not as horrifying, but you just, so you continue. So I just continue to do it. Like, okay, well, here's, where's the next thing. And sometimes it turns into a Rolodex. Maybe you and I talked about this, a Rolodex of just people in your life. Yeah. Like, you know, like you're like, okay, well now, now that, now that I have this lens, now that I have like the, you know, it's like the positive eye of Sauron, kind of like the good, the eye of like, you know, the, the, the beautiful, whatever the opposite of that is, where it's just that you're seeing with clear sight, then you kind of want to start looking at everything that you can. So you can try to mend things and you can kind of see what's going on. So um, there's definitely sometimes it's like a Rolodex of people and like mm -hmm. looking at them for like any charge or looking at them for anything that needs to be talked about or, or brought out and that kind of a thing. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. You know, I, I think, um, you know, I, I use the analogy of like upgrading the operating system when I, when I know it's time for another journey, you know, for me, it's like, you know, kind of like when your computer is starting to freeze up a lot and, you know, starting to, to, to get real slow and, and is, is not really as responsive as it should be. And then sometimes it just shuts down on its own. With, with, and you're like, God damn it, I lost all this work I've been working on for the last half an hour. And, you know, I think when you start to, what for me personally, when I start to experience that sort of feeling in my day-to-day -day life as far as what's going on up here mm -hmm. in my head, that's 
when I know it's like, all right, time, time for another upgrade to my operating system. I don't want to continue to live like this, continue to, I, I, rather than live from a place of frustration or irritability or lack of flow and creative energy and, and lack of love, I want to move more into love, acceptance, creativity, flow, gratitude, you know, and I think it's natural just living stressful day-to-day -day lives. We start to lose those things. And I think it's, it's good to have rituals on a daily basis. And also maybe some of these, these, these bigger journeys once in a, once in a while that help reconnect you to, I think the higher intelligences of like what is really important and valuable in life. Totally. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I, I think that that's a that's something that I think is being lost maybe a little bit now is people are starting to just do this on a, like a, on a weekly basis, you know. And and I, I'm I'm not saying that there's a, a right way and a wrong way um, to do it, but I do think there is a risk. It anything can be abused. Anything can be you know. You can build up a tolerance to anything. You know, mm -hmm. I know plenty of people who sit in a ceremony every weekend who, if, at least from my own BS detector, you know, I'm like. Mm. I don't think this is really, I don't think this is really helping you. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, I don't think this is really what you need. Like maybe we need is the exact opposite of this. Maybe you yeah. need to like, you know. Just more day to day life and, and, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, and less <laughs> deep insights while. for a little while. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, we've, we've talked a lot about entheogens here. We've gone a little bit over time. Do you have like 10 more minutes that you could spare? Cause sure. uh, right now I want to shift discussion to, to your new film, Remedy, which is launching right now. I've already, I've already sent out um, an, a couple emails to my audience letting them know about it. So we've Thanks. already got, I know several thousand people have signed up for it, but talk to me about Remedy. And I know obviously, you know, for anybody thinking that the whole focus is all about entheogens, just to clarify, Remedy is, is not really about hallucinogenic plant medicines or, or that kind of thing that we've been talking about for the last 20 or 30 minutes. But is is really about herbal medicines for treating a lot of ailments and also just living with greater health and energy and vitality. So, so talk to me about Remedy. So Remedy is a nine part docu series. We sat down with a number of different um, experts in the health world, but really a lot of scientists and a lot of herbalists, you know, predominantly, to find the most promising, powerful, effective um, plants in the world for the conditions that plague our society today. So yeah, entheogens are, are one way to go for, they have a specific use, you know, and I think that from what you and I just were talking about, it's, a, it's something that you do uh, in ceremony and you do it in t with intentionality and you do it, um, you know, every once in a while when you need when you need that little extra something a little extra insight whereas there's tons and tons and tons of herbs around the world that are being used and have been used for thousands of years on a regular basis to you know for everyday wellness to kind of keep your body in balance to give you energy to give you better sleep to um to clarify thought and there are three main schools of herbalism that we're focusing on there are probably the three main schools of herbalism that would come to mind if you were if you were, you know, um, if you were talking to someone about herbalism who knew, you know, who was in the know, there's probably three big schools of herbalism. One of them is Chinese herbalism. The Chinese have been doing this for like thousands and thousands of years. Their texts, their medical texts are literally thousands and thousands of years old with formulas that are still being used today, um, have not been adjusted because they still work so well. In hospitals, again, like in hospitals in China, regular everyday hospitals, they also have herbs that are being used in the same proportions as they were thousands of years ago. Ayurvedic medicine um, from India is the second school. Another very, very vast, vast school of healing plants that has been in existence for a long time. And then the, the third is Western herbalism, which is more North American and European herbalism, which if you're in the States, it's the kind of herbalism, it's like that's the folk herbalism that our grandmas might have might have practiced um, and brought over. I mean, I'm from, I'm, I'm from Italy and Ireland, and I have, I have a little bit of both on both sides that I just know is still, you know, still used. Um, so, um, both, uh, all three of these schools have a lot to offer in the way of healing chronic illness. We're not trying to figure out how to heal broken bones with herbs. That's not, that's not what I'm after. I think that, I think emergency medicine, modern medicine, 
is extremely good at things like that. Um, but chronic illness is something that is plaguing our society and in large part, modern medicine doesn't have an answer to. So we're going into things like pain, <clears throat> what you can do for pain using a variety of different herbs that have been around for a very long time. What you can do for stress and anxiety, which many, many believe is the root of all illness. And from what I've experienced uh, in my travels, I tend to agree. So what you can do to eliminate stress and anxiety, whether it's literally mental stress or stress in the body and, and uh, systems and energetics within your body. We're going into cognitive function, which is something that herbs are incredibly good at. Um, how, to, how to have more memory, clarity, and focus. And, and then also going into some of the more serious illnesses um, in, the, in, in the brain, the brain area. And we're also going into more serious illnesses in the brain, you know, the, uh, that, that, that are sort of reside in that region, like Parkinson's disease, MS, um, Alzheimer's and any herbs that can be used to to heal those. I mean, the numbers on these things are incredible. When you get into this stuff, it's it's fascinating. First of all, the numbers on, on the success rate that modern medicine has are startlingly low. You're like, wow, so that's 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 it. Like that's the efficacy rate. But how come that's all we know about? And then you look at the efficacy rate of herbs, which are usually just as good, if not better, and they have little to no side effects. So yeah, yeah. you know, just just as one example of this, like I've seen a trial of. I think it's called Azelect, uh, an Alzheimer's drug versus saffron. And I think saffron, just straight saffron and nothing else. No lifestyle intervention, no diet overhaul, just saffron pills. Um, I, I think was at least as effective, if not more effective. And you know, you know what's the, the real mind job of that is that, is that stuff like saffron and rosemary um, and potentially even go to cola. Um, they've done studies on those things. I was talking to Sayer G. Do you know Sayer G from Green Med Info? He's, yeah. he's, uh, he's in the series, but he was, he was uh, making this point um, that you look at these studies and, and some of them, you know, you'd think that the more, the more you take, the better, or the more you take, the more potent, the more drastic your results. And some of, some of them really are that way. Um, things like turmeric seem to be kind of like that. Um, but uh, some of them, it's actually a specific dose. You go higher, it's not going to be as good. You go lower, it's not going to be as good. You get a, the right dose. And it's not like, um, it's just, it's not, um, it's not intuitive. It's not something that you'd be like, oh yeah, that makes sense. It's like literally like a certain, a certain like, you know, one gram or like a half of a gram. And then if you go any more, then the results kind of fade away um, of rosemary for Alzheimer's or dementia. Like it's very interesting when you start getting down to it, like in the energetics of, of things and the, and the formula, the formulas of, uh, of herbs and how important it is to get the proportions right for the, the individual. Um, it's interesting how the, how how, you, how more isn't always better, I guess, when you're talking about um, plant medicines. Well, you know, if you if you, it sounds like kind of a, a weird idea, but on the other hand, it's actually fairly common knowledge. Like if you think about exercise, for example, exercise is really powerful medicine, but really important to get the dose right. Too little below your that person's fitness level and what their body is adapted to, and you're not really doing anything. You're not mm -hmm. stimulating any new adaptations. If you exceed that person's fitness level too much and go way beyond what their body's adapted for, then you just cause trauma, you make them exhausted, you cause damage and inflammation, and it, it's mostly counterproductive. And if it's really extreme, like in extreme endurance athletes, sometimes you get calcifications of the arteries, heart attacks, things like that. So yeah, you got to know your fitness level and then do just the right amount or just a little bit beyond it to start to stimulate a little greater adaptations but yeah getting that dose right is really important totally it's so it's it's been a mind-blowing experience just creating the project you know we we also we have we have um a whole episode on cancer which has been you know i, I make these films and like you know uh, my, my buddy jeff um says that some people say hey jeff how do you do all your research um, and he's like, you watch my research. Like, I don't, I start off, I ask a question and then I film these interviews so I could find out what the heck's going on. And that's kind of how this project's been. And it's very um, humbling when you go into a project with some certain assumptions and then you sit down with experts who are extremely good at what they do and they just shatter your, your existing belief systems mm. uh, about how things are supposed to be. For instance, I walked, I went into this, uh, this series with a pretty, um, with a pretty big chip on my shoulder about um, modern medicine and its, and, its, and its approaches to treating cancer. Well, I came out of this experience with a number of amazing herbs that are being used in China specifically, um, as well as a few other countries that are very effective and promising for the treatment of cancer. But I also came out of this with a new appreciation of some of the modern interventions that are available too, and how they can dovetail very, very nicely with, with herbs and the importance of, of an integrative approach. So it's, it's really amazing to be um, 
to be doing to be doing this for a living. Going back to that, your original point, I loved what I do for a living, mm -hmm. um, and I think that the one thing I'm most proud of about this this series is that there are a lot of things coming out right now that are very and and, and we talk, mentioned this before. There's a lot of people who are who are um, uh, making crazy claims out there, and and and, and I, I'm not saying that those people are necessarily you know doing it for any bad reason. I just think there's a lot of voices out there and people are trying to be the loudest and and get attention and i think that when you're dealing with conditions that are as dire as something like cancer um you need to be very careful about what you're saying to the world you know so um and cancer is just among many other things but you know um and i think that what i'm most proud of is that the work that we're doing and the the um the information we're putting out is is really 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 well vetted and it's very even-handed. There isn't, there isn't a, um, there, we're not trying to put anybody down. You know, we're, yeah, we are exposing some truths about modern medicine, but that's real. Like, th th those are things that are actually happening um, that people need to know about. We're not saying the herb, that herbs are the answer for everything, um, but we are showing you where they can be highly effective. We don't want to waste anybody's time, specifically for people who are really dealing with, with the more harsh conditions. We want everyone to have um, the resources at their disposal that they need to make the most educated decisions they can. So. If we're talking about it, if we're covering it in an episode, it's because we're confident that it's something that, you know, that you need to know about. So, yeah, be beautifully said. And I, I, I really appreciate that. Um, I completely agree that there are people out there that are saying all kinds of wacky stuff that is not supported by the evidence and is also not even handed, is, is really misrepresenting things and giving um, a, a kind of just a false impression of effectiveness or ineffectiveness of various approaches. So, I, I appreciate the value system that this is coming from. So um, I, I, I appreciate the extra time that you've taken to do this interview with me as well. So real quick, can you give kind of an overview of what people can get in the documentary? It, so sure. obviously there's an episode on cancer, but what are some of the other episodes? So, okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna do a little lightning round on this. So, <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so episode one is, it's all about, um, it's all about modern medicine and herbalism. It's all about how they how they they have sort of interfaced with each other in the last hundred years. Why it's why you don't know about herbalism. It's why you really only know predominantly about modern medicine. And there is there is some really interesting, slightly conspiracy theorist stuff there, but actually very founded in fact um, in history. So we have a little history lesson in the beginning where we then we kind of explain to you you know how the, the, the coevolution of humans and plants is basically episode one. Then we go into, for, from um, episode two through nine, we go into specific herbs for specific illness, so, illnesses. So the episode two is uh, all about stress and anxiety, um, with a second part on chronic pain. So it's a two-parter, episode two. Episode three is all about the immune system and the microbiome, so another two-parter. We start with the immune system, and then we, then we dive headlong into the microbiome and the herbs we can use to support those trillions of microorganisms that dwell inside of our body and largely contribute to our health. So those two systems are very intertwined. Um, and uh, as you'll find out in episode three, um, and so episode four is all about cognitive function, brain health, memory, clarity, focus, and the, the more serious illnesses that can, can happen. Um, episode five is all about Lyme disease and co-infections. It's an epidemic that um, touched my life very, very recently. My son got, got Lyme last year and we used herbs to get him better. Um, but it's an incredible episode just talking about um, bacterial infections in Lyme um, and, and how to know if you have one um, and what to do if you, you find out that you have one. So episode six is all about heart health and with, with the second um, part on depression. And is another one of these amazing uh, um, uh, revelations that I've had on just making this project and literally just having it told to me by numerous different herbalists from different schools is that there's a direct connection between your heart health and, and symptoms of depression. So um, we have a whole first half on what to do for, for good circulation and for a healthy heart, but then we dovetail right into depression and herbs that you can use to alleviate those symptoms. Um, episode seven is on energy and sleep. Um, it's basically just diving into how to have more energy, how to get the best night of sleep ever. Um, and then fatigue goes away, obviously, when you kind of handle, handle that. Um, episode eight is all about um, cancer. So that, that's, a, that's a pretty long episode, real, really crammed with a lot of great information. Um, and then episode nine is about uh, sex, hormones, and overall reproductive health. So those are our nine 
episodes. And basically you can put an herbs four in front of every single one of those episode titles. Beautiful. I love it, man. Well, that, it sounds great. I'm, I'm excited to, to see it myself. Uh, and, um, also importantly, what are the dates? Cause you are, Oh, I should also say to people, this is not, you're not asking for money to see all of this material. You're giving this away for free. Yeah. When, and it's free during specific dates. So what are those dates? So uh, it is free. So, so the, the episode one premieres on September 5th. And then there's going to be one episode a day from the 5th through the 13th. Um, and you'll be able to watch episode one for the entire, the entire event. But every other episode is only going to be up for 24 hours. So you got you to gotta register. You got to tune in. And you got to um, make sure you open up the emails we send you on the day that the episode comes out. So you can watch it in the period, the viewing window that we're offering it for free. Beautiful, so, man. The 5th. I September through the 13th. Awesome. Well, I, I'm going to rush to get this podcast out so that we get it out before then or at the very latest during then, but hopefully this coming weekend. Um, so Nick, it's been such a pleasure. Thank you so much for taking time out of your day and extra time to do this interview with me. It's, it's really, I've really, really enjoyed this conversation and I, uh, I really appreciate the work that you're doing. I think it's very important work and uh, I appreciate you getting the word out on plant medicines for both physical, psychological, and spiritual ailments. I, I really value everything you're doing. So thank you for the work you're doing, and thank you for joining me on the podcast today. All right. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's, it's an honor to be here with you. Awesome, brother. Well, take care and enjoy the rest of your day.